I had a fella come up to me the other night, um, not the other night, but about a year ago, I was doing a gig in St Albans in, near London and uh, he came up to me and uh, he looked very like me. <laughs> like he was my genuine doppelganger and he came up to me not to kind of have a laugh, he came up to give out to me, saying that his life is a misery because he looks like me. <laughs> and it turned out he was a policeman in London. That's, oh, that no. was his job and that no one took him seriously. And he was like genuinely upset about this. <laughs> I'm looking at him, it's not my fault. And he's looking <laughs> at me and he, he actually told me about the first time he ever made an arrest. <laughs> so the criminals start laughing and I'm going, for fuck's sake, I've been arrested by Father Duke. <laughs> Welcome to Ireland Unfiltered. This week's guest is Ardell O'Hanlon. Ardell is about to go on the road again. Well, in October, he'll be going on the road again with the Showing Off Must Go On tour. He'll be playing in the Cork Opera House on the 30th of October, Vicar Street on the 9th of November, and the University Concert Hall in Limerick on the 29th of November. He's also in Galway at the Vodafone Comedy Carnival on the 26th of, November, oh, 26th of October with the Showing Off Must Go On tour. We talked about going back on the road, about being a stand-up. Uh, showing off isn't something that comes naturally to Ardell. And it was a, one of the most enjoyable, illuminating episodes in the series because Ardell is one of the great figures of, of Irish comedy, not, through, not just through what he did on Father Ted with Father Dougal, but just because of uh, his, the, the observation and intelligence he's brought to everything he's done. Um, before we go to that, interview don't forget to subscribe to Ireland Filtered on all the usual channels and if you like the show please leave a review. Ardell it's a great pleasure and a privilege to have you on Ireland Unfiltered. Thank you um, it's lovely to be here. You know, it's great to have you here. I really love your chairs I, I, I genuinely mean that. Really? Just ergonomically I think they're it's one of it's one of the best chairs I've I've ever sat on. That's fantastic we'll put that on if we don't have posters but I know. You know, we could get that one of the best chairs. You get nothing else out of this interview it's a fantastic chair. You, can, you know I'd like to say that you can take it with you and when, when you go but uh, I really want it because I, I genuinely don't have any chair at home that I like. Really? Yeah I'm, I'm, I'm really uncomfortable in my own home every night <laughs> I try to find somewhere to sit down and I can't and I end up pacing. Okay, that seems like, you know, a, an oversight. It is an oversight and, I, and it's something I need to get around to eventually, like, you know, Cause, you know before we, the next I, World I, Cup. I, <laughs> well, that's it. Like, how many World Cups have you had in this house and you've never found yes. a chair that you're comfortable Three, in? Four. Right. I got, actually got a special chair made for my back uh, uh, for the 2002 World Cup. Okay. And uh, that was brilliant. And yeah, it lasted yeah. up to a couple of years ago. But, you know, eventually, you know, I sat in it a bit too much. Right. Because you have a bad back. Uh, I did, yeah. You I've did. had a few right. surgeries. Have you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so, so I need a good chair. That's what I'm saying. Right. This, this is why this chair has impressed me so much. But even that didn't, lend, because like, you know, I was thinking, you know, one of the things might be being uncomfortable in your own skin. I didn't expect you to come out and just straight away say you're uncomfortable in your own home. You're just, just uncomfortable, <laughs> generally. I mean, isn't everyone? But everyone is, I guess. Yeah, slightly uneasy. <laughs> but that's the human condition. It is really, yeah. Um, but you're, you're going back... Uh, you're going back on the road in October. Tell me about those tours because you once said if if you're a if you're a stand up you're a stand up for life. Yeah, yeah, it's a it's a niche you've got to scratch. It's a yeah. it's a it's a very strong impulse. Uh, even when you think you're you, you're kind of going to quit, mm. which you know I think about pretty much after every show. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, you're right back up there the next day. You know, it's because it's not just about the shows. Of course, it's about the whole lifestyle that goes with mm. that. It's about, you know, how you spend your day. And of course, you spend your day, you know, trying to mine your brain and every other, you know, source for, for inspiration. Mm. And, 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 you know, I just find like it's, it's, it, it gives you a purpose in life. Mm. It makes you feel very alive, actually, right. and, and it gives you a kind of a purpose. You know, I mean, I, I would be as prone to inertia as every other human being out yeah. there. You know what I mean? So I kind of need this pressure in my life and the pressure to perform, to stand up in front of a live audience, but also the pressure to try and understand the world a bit better. And, mm. you know, and I think stand up is a great way of doing that, of making sense of the world. And does it help? It does help you do that. Yeah, I think it does yeah. because you're, you're you're kind of forced to read the papers or, you know, uh, uh, you know, every day, like the first thing I do every morning is grab my phone and you spend mm. hours, you know, scouring through the papers, like just annoying mm. yourself. And you know, this is before you've even talked to anyone or <laughs> got a hug, yeah. you know, or eaten toast or yeah, anything. Or and, sat in an uncomfortable chair. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so you're already appalled and <laughs> outraged. You know, this is before you've got out of bed. Yeah. 
um, so this so this is this is this is the way I engage with the world. So you you, you know you have to be well informed mm. to be a comedian. You have to be. I suppose you have to be in touch with like popular culture, what's going on. Mm. You know, you 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 what you ha- you you have to watch everything on telly, yeah. everything on Netflix. You have to have seen it. Uh, you have to listen to every new album that comes out. You have to go to every movie. You know, so you you have to be engaged. You've got to know what's going on in politics, mm. who's who, and even if you don't actually use any of that stuff, you know, it's there. Yeah, um, in some way. And is that like when you say you know after every show you feel like you know packing it in like is that sort of uh, conflict or that thing that propels you on stage and that means you have to be alert to everything also the thing that kind of can be bring to bring a lot of trepidation yeah it's, yeah kind of like it's it's you know there is this very strong impulse to get on stage but there's also like you know I'm, I'm a shy person yeah. I think Irish people generally are pretty shy people you know uh, mm. uh, it, there's something unnatural about it about putting yourself out there uh, I call my my touring show, the, the showing off must go on because, yeah. you know, that kind of alludes to that conflict that's always there. Mm. You know, on the one hand, you know, you're very conscious that this is showing off. Uh, and where I come from, Monaghan, you know, showing off is a terrible, terrible yeah. thing. You know, it's the worst thing you can do. It's worse than armed robbery or laundering <laughs> diesel or, you know, any of those other things. Yeah. Uh, uh, showing off is just a really bad thing to do. And, you know, when I was a kid, like, you know, people wouldn't wear high-vis jackets in the town because that would be showing off, drawing <laughs> attention to yourself. You know, look at the big show off there. Once ever you see him, like, out on the road at night, who does he get? You know, so, you know, so so I've always had that conflict, right. I, I have to say. And, and even though I love the actual... Um, experience, the live experience, you know, that mm. feeling of being alive, that feeling of being able to articulate yourself, the feeling of landing when something lands that you've worked very mm. hard at and, you know, your gamble is paid off, all the hard work is paid off and people are laughing and people are relating to you and, you know, and, and you're doing your job as a comedian, which is like to be a, a, a corner boy, sneering at mm. everyone and everything mm. and, 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 and people are appreciating that, you know, so there's no reason why you'd want to not do that the next day. But then you get up in the morning and you go, well, you know, it's still yeah. showing off and it's, yeah. who do you think you are? And is there a fear then, like, is that the fear of what it's going to be like or of, of failing in it, the thing that kind of propels you to do it as well as you can yeah, do it? Yeah, there is that. I mean, that's why I would keep going back to it. You mm. know, even though I leave quite big gaps between the touring shows, mm. um, it doesn't mean I'm not doing it all the time. You know, I'm still yeah. doing the same thing I do every day and I'm still running into clubs in Dublin, trying it out and doing festivals around the world and doing little mini tours and, you know, mm. Asia or, or right. stuff yeah, like yeah. that where yeah. you think nobody will notice uh, <laughs> what you're up to. And, um, you know, so, so you know, that, that, that impulse is always, it's always there, mm. you know. And is it that the, the uh, like, talk to me about the, that shyness then, because, you know, you do hear and that sense of, you know, showing off that maybe Irish people have. Because one of the things that struck me, and we've talked about this with guests on this show before, is that Irish idea of notions. Yeah. You know, and like... The notions. Notions. Like, yeah. And I, I always, like, in some ways, maybe having notions is, is kind of a good thing. You know, yeah. to kind of want to better your, you know, to have better ideas. But it's a way Irish people have now yeah. found of kind of, let's know, you, you, that's, yeah. you've got yeah. notions. In Australia, they call it the tall poppy syndrome, yeah. don't they? And, uh yeah, it was similar. I mean, you know, I mean, I, I remember my mother made spaghetti bolognese for us, told us not to tell anyone, you know, <laughs> don't tell anyone about the spaghetti bolognese. You know, people would think we had notions that, oh, the O'Hanlons have gone all Italian, you know. <laughs> Next, they'd be throwing tomatoes at each other and showing affection in public. And, you know, so, um, y- you know, so there is there is that. And, I, I you know, and I, and I kind of, I, I bought into that, you know, mm. it's one of the things I like most about the Irish people. It's one mm. of the most endearing qualities is that, you know, we're by and large modest people, you yeah. know, um, we're not, we don't condescend towards other nations. I mean, we think we're great, yeah. but, you know, it's usually in a, you know, quite a, a cheerful, non-threatening way. Mm. You know, I love the way Irish supporters always behave abroad. You've traveled widely mm. with Irish supporters, mm. the Irish football team, you know, and, and even though it's a little bit, you know, it's a little bit much in recent years, you know, where it's a kind of, they've almost become a parody of themselves yeah. in, a, in a sense. Yeah. But, you know, it's still great that Irish people, this is the way we want to project ourselves. Yeah. You know, we want to be ambassadors for our nation. We want to put our best foot forward. Mm. We want to sell this idea that we're gas crack all together. Yeah. Uh, you know, and it works. It works yeah. for us. Um, talk to me then, like, like from that background where putting your head above the parapet in any way was seen as, as something peculiar and just not to be encouraged at all. 
like how you found yourself going down the roads you did go down? Yeah, I, I, I really, I really no idea. I, I mean, I, my father was in politics, so, mm. but he was a cautious politician. Yeah. You know, he, he, he came from Fianna Fáil, uh, if he was, he was part of that party. Uh, and, you know, he, 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 he wouldn't have been one of the more outspoken people mm. or certainly not one of the flamboyant kind of mohair suited brigade yeah. of the 60s and 70s. He was a very modest man, very hardworking person. Um, and, you know, but he did put himself out there. And yeah. I saw this very shy, maybe kind of slightly awkward man mm. uh, putting himself out there um, because he, he believed in it. Now, I, I yeah. didn't necessarily share those beliefs, but he loved his country and, um, you know, uh, couldn't do enough for people. You know, that was his nature. Mm. And, uh, you know, I, I saw all that in action. So I suppose when it, when, when it came for my turn to, 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 to do something like that, you know, to go out there, put yourself out there, uh, it was a big effort, mm. but I'd, I, 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 you know, I'd, I'd seen my father do something not entirely dissimilar. Yeah. So I suppose. And how, know, how did you feel about that? Because I'm interested in how that must have felt. As because clearly the thing you've 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 written novels. You've you know stand up of, depends on observation too, on like understanding human nature. Yeah. Like what did you observe from seeing this shy man? presenting himself in public and then how he would have to interact with the public. Like what yeah. was, can you remember how that would, would strike you? Um, well, I mean, you know, I could see that it was like, it was painful for him, but that you kind of, uh, uh, when you go out in public, you adopt a, a persona. Yeah. So you project yourself in a different way. You know, mm. you put on a different hat, I think. You know, he was very different in the house. He was right. very easygoing and humorous and, yeah. You know, uh, enjoyed his time with his family. You know, you know, whatever little time he had. Mm. I'm not bitter. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, you know the real reason I do comedy. I didn't get enough attention as a child. Um, but, but, but. Uh, uh, no, I was, I was gonna, I was gonna say something. Um, but, but where I grew up, I think, you know, County Monaghan. Mm. Just generally, people were were very deadpan. Yeah, um, people were very humorous, but you didn't know whether they were being funny or not a lot of the time mm. because they didn't give anything away. So that was a huge part of the the culture on the border. Right. Yeah. You know, it was cagey, cagey all the time. Um, speaking out of both sides of your mouth was was a was a great gift mm. that that the local people had. Um, and the deadpan humor, you know. Maybe a wink just to yeah. let you know that it was humor. Right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but that was about it. So I was very influenced by that, very inspired mm. by that kind of thing. Certainly in my early days as a stand up, you know, mm. where, you know, I would go out there and I suppose be very deadpan and just, you know, have a very kind of bewildered persona. Yeah. You know, I was genuinely nervous doing it. Yeah. But, I, but, but, but I actually think my persona developed a little bit out of that nervousness. Mm. And that self-consciousness. So it was like a very awkward, self-conscious, sort of a bewildered person. But say, I hope, you know, in, in saying quite clever things, but yeah. it, as this bewildered persona. And like you were third of, of six yeah. in your family. And then no you... photos of me in the house. <laughs> right. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> I get it. I mean, I'm a parent myself with three kids. Right, I yeah, get it. Yeah. The novelty wears off after the first one. I know. I mean, it's fine. I'm not bitter. <laughs> I'm actually the only one in my family who turned out in any way well adjusted and really normal and, okay. uh, and totally free of bitterness. Right. Okay. It's coming across <laughs> all right. <laughs> and then, but then you went to then you went to did you go, did you go to boarding school? Did you board? Did, yeah. yeah. So I I uh, my I, I just saw a photograph last night in the house. We were we were doing some work in the house and clearing out stuff, and I found a photograph in 1971 of me mm. in primary school. Mm. I would have been six years old. Uh, so I went to the local primary school, and that was in a brilliant early education. Yeah. You know. Uh, you, you you know, 50 boys in the class. Yeah. Uh, spent most of the day trying to talk the teacher down from the roof. I, I seem to remember, you know, it was like, it was chaos, mm. you know. Uh, um, but it was great formative stuff. And then at the age of 12, there was a bit of a wrench sent off to boarding school. Yeah. Um, and that was a different experience. And that was, that was Black Rock College. Like that yeah. was a, a big school. I went to Black Rock and I went when I was older, but I was later than everyone else. And I was very shy. And I found it terrifying. Yeah. Because it was 180 people yeah. in a year and you had to sink or swim. And there was all these people who clearly were going to be the future yeah. leaders yeah. and the big personalities. Yeah. I, I felt intimidated, I have Did to say, you? when I went in first, yeah. 
been a been a, a country boy mm. and a shy country boy at that, uh, coming into this environment where people were so much more confident. Yeah. And I hesitate to use the word entitled because I, I didn't know that word at the mm. time. Uh, but, you know, they just had this air about them that they yeah. were going to walk into businesses and the professions and, mm. um, uh, you know, but like thoroughly decent people. Uh, mm. But just, you know, there was this expectation that that's that's how you would turn out. Um, and and, and I, I found that a little bit a little bit tough to adjust to. Yeah, I was really skinny as well, so I wasn't really a, a rugby player. And mm. you know, soccer was my, yeah. my number one game. And uh, uh, you know, I, I did I did find it a tough environment. And you do have to grow up fast mm. uh, in boarding school, away from your family. I think um, you learn to be very self sufficient, uh, very independent minded. You know, you're also exposed to much more things than you're going to be exposed to in your in your small rural town. Mm. Uh, you're going to be exposed to new music. You know, I remember people playing the doors, right. the dormitory, yeah, you know, yeah, and that was yeah. so exciting. A whole new world opens mm. up straight away. And Emerson Lake and Palmer, don't know about that. but S- Sort of. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then the Sex Pistols, of course, right, and yeah, stuff yeah. like that. So, you know, um, and books, you know, you're, you're, there's books being shared around the dorm mm. that, you know, you don't come across at home. Um so, yeah, so I think you grow up quite quite quickly. Uh, you learn strategies, you yeah. know, um, humour being, being an obvious one, um, you know, for a shy kid, you know, but to have a good comeback was a good thing. Mm. Um, uh, so, you know, I mean, like while I didn't like love my time at boarding school, mm. you know, I appreciate it for what it is. I also appreciate in hindsight that it was a very privileged education in many, many ways. Not that it, any, it opened doors for me because I kind of, I suppose I rejected that. Yeah. Uh, after school, I went to a college on the north side, mm. <laughs> Dublin, for a start, um, and uh, uh, probably the only one for my year that did. Mm. And you know, and then I, I I got into comedy and stuff like that, which was about as far removed from that world as as you could get. But were you like you, you you've talked about the devices used and humour being you know one of the key ones? Were you able to hide there too, or did you feel like? You know, because you've talked about it already, like not being, you know, that ambition and people wanting to be the cap, you know, leaders and mm. like, did you feel that foisted upon you in any way or was it something you were just going to reject? Well, not really. You kind of, I suppose you kind of objected to, you know, you love the rugby team and the rugby players and everything, but you kind of, I suppose, resented having to cheer for them mm. and yeah. Uh, sing the praises after matches yeah, yeah. and you know there was clearly a, a hierarchy in the mm. school and and you know it, it's a bit like the jock culture in America yeah uh, that we're all so familiar with from American movies mm. and stuff uh, so it was a bit like that but you know I mean at the time I don't know like you find your level and you find your people yeah and you know I I, I suppose yeah and I played rugby and I loved it and I played soccer and I, and I got on fine and I had friends and you know we, we I got on absolutely fine but I, I think I was always that sort of I mean, even shy is not even the right word, really. It's kind of watchful, right? You know, and and yeah. um, you know, you you an observer. I read an awful lot when mm. I was a kid, like mm. and right throughout throughout my teens. Like I just read all the time. I was a daydreamer. Spent all my spare time reading novels. Never really studied very hard mm. or anything like that. Um, you know, so. And what did you think you wanted to do? I kind of thought about journalism right. or writing in some capacity yeah. like you know i had a few friends i remember towards the end of my time in black rock where you know we used to write poems and it was incredibly pretentious <laughs> stuff and uh, we used to go down to the railway tracks and read them to each other <laughs> read our poems to each other <laughs> <laughs> can you remember those poems <laughs> no. uh, uh, but then i remember there was one key moment when uh when i suddenly decided and i really can't for the life of me work out why i i did this but there was a, an end of year school debate in sixth year. Mm. And I put myself forward for it. Right. And I don't really know why to this day. Uh, and I remember going up there. I worked on my little speech for the week. And I'd never been in a debate before, never spoken in public, wouldn't answer a question in mm. class. But that day I decided to go for it. I hadn't even told any of my friends. I just entered the debate okay. and um, brought the house down. Great. Uh, you know, it was just, and it was just like a, it was like a light switch for me. Mm. It was like, it doesn't matter who you are or, or, you know, how you conduct yourself, but you can, you can do this. Right. Um, and, you know, you just have to put on a mask. 
Yeah. You know, and go out there. And was it a mask? Well, it was a it was a it was a kind of a mask. I mean, I was I was quivering uncontrollably mm. and I was sweating profusely. Yeah. And, you know, I, my body was 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 resisting and, and uh, you know, I was having a very physical reaction, mm. but I managed to keep it all together and I managed to get out my, my the speech that I'd learned off by heart. Right. And I said it and 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 I got loads of laughs. And, you know, the, the other debaters were debating about whatever the motion was. Mm. I wasn't. I just wrote a speech <laughs> about a surreal speech. Yeah. And uh, it got a big, big laugh. And I just remember thinking that is brilliant and just feeling that reaction and feeling that adrenaline surge being up there. And extraordinary. What, and was there a sense because like this is something that's come across, come up a lot with performers like Barry Kogan, who was on the show, like the first time Barry acted, he said there was this moment, this release where he felt yeah. this is what I want. Yeah. Like this feeling is what I want. And this is where I feel a bit of peace or whatever. Yeah. Was that something similar for you, do you think, yeah. like in, in that when you got the laughs? Yeah, yeah, yeah I definitely felt that, definitely. And I, I remember then when I went on to university, um, DCU, mm. uh, which was then NIHE, um, I remember like fairly soon getting involved in kind of pranks and, right. you know, uh, running for election as student union president. And, okay. You know, uh, stuff that would have been out of character for me right. if you had not known me before then. But like a lot of the, so you, but you weren't in doing it in any way following in your father's footsteps because, you know, like a lot of the student, those things are like the sort of the breeding ground. Yeah, no. For, as we've opposite. seen in the UK now, there's like a breeding yeah. ground of, you know, student unions being the breeding ground for the people who are destroying Britain. Yeah. But it wasn't yeah. that, it wasn't. Not in the slightest. It was the opposite. Okay. It was, uh, it was purely as a prank. It was like yeah. running on a joke platform. Uh, you know, okay. I had this ridiculous manifesto with about a hundred things that I was going to do and. It was, you know, I thought it was hilarious at the time. Looking back on it now, not quite so funny. Uh, um, <laughs> you know, I, 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 my, my, you know, it wasn't quite developed, but it was like, you know, the concept was funny. Yeah, yeah. Running on a joke ticket for student union president, and I, you know, recruited a few allies. Barry Murphy being one of them, yeah. uh, who, who I went on to be part of Mr. Trellis with, uh, and Kevin Gildee was actually really involved in student politics. He was quite serious, okay, yeah, serious yeah. student politician, but. Uh, um, uh, so we did that and I entered debates mm. and tried to recreate that magic from the, the debate I did at school. Mm. So that was kind of, um, you know, and that was fun again, just going in there to sabotage the thing, to undermine everyone else. That was right. The, that was the instinct. And that was always the thing. It was always the instinct, yeah. And how, and so then from there, where was that taken? Just a sneer. <laughs> just a sneer. Well, that's what, you know, as you said, like you've got to always be ready to, you know, know yeah. have all the ammunition ready yeah. to, to do that. And was that where you then saw, right? Did you then think there's a path in this? There's a future in this? Or is it something when you're in college, you're thinking, you know, this is past, This is a good way to pass the time? Thinking it was a good way to pass the time, really. Um, leaving college in the 80s, late 80s, you know, uh, there was, wasn't much going on. Mm. Um, you know, and just wanting to sort of carry on with that. Like, I, I mean, there was a kind of a gloom I mean, yeah. a gloominess generally that prevailed in Ireland at the time. A lot of people emigrated at that time. Um, the recession was very deep and very painful for everyone. Um, you know, there were no jobs, no job prospects for graduates. Mm. It was a really, it was a really, really horrendous time. Uh, and one way of dealing with that, I suppose, was to, you know, just go, well, you know, I'm never going to have a job. I'm never going to have a home. Mm. Um but let's amuse ourselves by doing this stand up comedy thing. And again, and, and at that time, it was there was a, quite a big movement in Britain. You, you know, we saw that we saw the evidence of that on our television screens mm. at the weekends. You know, this 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 stand up thing was really taken off in a massive way. Yeah. And so I suppose in a tiny way, we tried to emulate that by setting up a little comedy club, mm. which became ultimately the comedy cellar in the International Bar right. in Dublin. And. You know, it was just, a, it was a way of passing the time. Uh, but, it, you know, it was, I mean, there was a melancholy there. You know, there was yeah. a kind of a, a feeling that we weren't going to amount to much. And, you know, this is going to be our life doing a gig once or twice a month. And, you know, having fun, like, and, mm. you know, spending whatever few pence you could scrape together on drink and, you know, watching the Brookside omnibus, you know. <laughs> So what is a pretty picture you're painting? I know yeah. it was it was it was it was miserable. <laughs> <laughs> but but is out that, of that misery, but is that not the is that not the is that the secret of it really that there was this misery and the kind of out of as you say like that yeah. out of that people 
but created yeah, but, something. Yeah, but I, yeah, yeah, but it was uh, exhilarating as well. I mean, you know, like the band scene in Dublin was brilliant. Yeah, the gig yeah. scene, the Blades, and mm. those Nervous Animals, and, yeah. and all those fantastic bands, yeah. Stars of Heaven, and yeah. you know. Oh, oh, it was just it was a great time right. in Dublin yeah, as yeah. well. You know, so yeah. you had that you had that underground scene. You also had like like you'd walk up Grafton Street, people would be reading their poems out loud. Mm. Mm. Now, okay, that's not everyone's idea of fun. Yeah. But there was legions of poets in Ireland yeah. in those days. Yeah. So some of them I'm sure really, really good, if yeah. you like if you like that sort of thing. But uh, and there was loads of writers. So, you know, there was a real vibrancy. Mm. You know, and, and and obviously nowadays, you know, those people aren't living in Dublin anymore. They're living in the Midlands. And, yeah. and they're equally unhappy. They're like we were in those days living in in squalid flats and bedsits in Dublin. Yeah. But they would kill for that now. Yeah, because they can't afford to live here. Yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, there was that very definite sense of creativity in the air. Yeah. Um, and it was all very natural. And people were all doing it for the right reasons. Like we were in comedy for the absolute right reasons. Mm. I mean, there was there was no obvious career path. Right. There was no even... There was no even notion, to use that word mm. again, of going to London and, mm. and making it or anything like that. It was yeah. just not on the radar. It was not, it wasn't considered to be a, 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 even the most remote possibility. So when you say you were looking at the you know, comedy scene in Britain and how that was taking off, you were using it as kind of like an, ins like an inspiration for the co comedy rather than thinking that's our pathway. We're just thinking like, like we always think in, in this post-colonial mm. society that we grew up in, you know, what, what, what are the English doing? Uh, right. Yeah. It must be right. <laughs> uh, so. I don't think like that anymore. No, we've no. Been, we've we, we're of on the high moral one. ground now. <laughs> they, should, they, they should look at us. I know. Um, but eventually, I suppose, you know, you know, you start doing comedy and you think, well, this is a nice way to pass your time. You know, mm. you, you get to hang out with your friends, you, you, mm. you get to read, you get to watch TV, uh, you get to go to the movies in the afternoon with a big sandwich, you know, yeah. and that yeah. was your life yeah. and it was great. But uh, you, you do it for a few years mm. and, you know, you realize that it's actually, you know, if you want to be good at it, you've got to work much, much harder. Uh, it's like anything, mm. um, you know, it becomes a, a, a it becomes a job. Yeah. You know, and you realize, well, look, you know, we're not too bad at this. So some of us decided that we'd pack our bags and we'd, we'd move over to London mm. um, because there was hundreds of clubs in London and up and down the country over there. So there was just loads of opportunities, loads of places to play. And we dabbled in Edinburgh, at the Edinburgh Festival, and we'd seen what was what was going on mm. and um, just gave it a go, you know. And. Was that, like you say, you, you, that realisation about, you know, you've got to take this seriously. But I, like, struck by something you said in, well, 96, but you said, I'm not driven and I have no real hunger for the job. So all that has happened has surprised me. Now, yeah, I'm, I'm thinking, is that, again, was that, um, was ambition, when you say you were always doing it for the right reasons, like you were doing it for, to be funny, like, was ambition ever part of your story? No, Has it ever become part of your, your story? Not to begin with. But I suppose, you know, like I was 28 when I left Dublin. Yeah. And I didn't show any signs of ambition up to that point. Mm. Uh, you obviously, you know, when you went on stage in the international bar in front of the 35 paying <laughs> customers, yeah. you wanted to be good and yeah. you wanted them to think that you were, you know, funny and everything else. So, you know, if that's ambition, well, then yes. But um, I just felt at the age of 28, uh, I by then I was in a long term relationship, you mm. know, you know, uh, and I, I was an insecure person. I suppose I felt I wasn't a worthy husband or mm. anything like that. Or, you know, I wasn't a functioning citizen. You know, I need to do something with my life. Yeah. So so it was more a it was more a scaring myself right. into doing okay. something meaningful with my yeah. life. You know, I was 28. I, I, I had nothing to, you know, mm. nothing to call my own. I, I, I you know. Um, so, so I went to London, last throw of the dice in a sense. Okay. That's how it felt. That's how it felt. Yeah. So it was like, I'm going to give this a year or two, mm. uh, give it my best shot, uh, go in there, take every gig very seriously and, you know, do the best I can. And, and, you know, very quickly I found that, uh, you know, I had a lot of the tools that I needed. Right. Cause yeah, that's the things did start working out for you quite yeah. quickly. You got, you know, newcomer of the year award. Yeah. That kind of thing. So it was, so immediately there was some uh, res dividend from it. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And did that change again how you were feeling about it? Like, Well, then you get more ambitious, I think. Right, then okay. Then I know, ever since I've been doing it for the wrong reasons. <laughs> <laughs> I just want fame and money. I mean, 
<laughs> Who doesn't? What's wrong with that? <laughs> uh, no, I, 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 I like to think that, I, you know, you're still in it for the right reasons, you know, mm. those fundamental reasons that yeah. you get up in the morning and you're, you know, you, you, you've no, you know, in my case, I, 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 you know, most of the pressure I put are, is, is, is self-imposed yeah. that I feel, you know, but I can't help the way I feel in the morning when I get up. You, you, you just feel like, you know, I need to, you know, I, I can do more, I can do better, I can, mm. you know, I can articulate myself better. You know, I feel things strongly, but, you know, I can't articulate it. Why can't I? And mm. then that's why you go to work and you, you try to put it into words and, you know, and, and I, I guess, you know, you're always just trying to find some, you know, do the perfect show, I suppose, mm. uh, will always keep, keep you interested. That's amazing. That's still with you now, is it? Like, you've oh, never... Absolutely. You never felt like, oh, I've nailed it. Or, no, you know. no, I, w- I, I would be terribly uh, um, insecure about all of that. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. No matter how good the last show was, you'd think, oh, they're going to hate me tonight. Right. And I think that's true for a lot of comedians, you, you know, so. But that's what, again, makes you, makes you driven to do it as well as you can do it. Yeah, probably. But it's also the thing of expressing yourself. That, that yeah, I can't emphasize the importance okay. of that. I'm sure it's why people go into journalism, why mm. people become writers, why people become songwriters. Mm. Why people write poems? It's because they, they have this need to express themselves, yeah. which most human beings have. And people, people, I, I guess, find it in different ways. Some people are just very socially brilliant, mm. and they get all they need out of that. Uh, some people, you know, have very responsible jobs, and you know, they're leaders of men and women, and they get you know tremendous rewards from that. Mm. And I guess if you're if you've got that impulse to create, you know, you just want to express yourself as clearly as possible. Mm. And even though most of my stuff is really stupid, <laughs> it's just silly <laughs> observations uh, yeah. about the minutiae of life. You know, you do s- distill everything you know into that, mm. and you boil it all down in your liberal sensibilities or whatever. You know, your yeah, yeah. and all your knowledge and all your hard won knowledge, yeah. hard earned knowledge. Yeah. You know, all that time I spent on the internet. <laughs> I want to put it to good use. <laughs> That's not going to go away. So it all, it's all filtered into your standard. Right. So even though the joke itself might be just a kind of a joke, yeah. an observation, you know, you like to think at the end of it all, people get a sense of who you are, where you're coming from, mm. what you believe in. And ultimately, you know, you, you, you know, you do feel a certain responsibility as a comedian. You know, once you decide what it is a comedian is supposed to do, yeah. the role of the jester in society, mm. You know, it is to uh, call bullshit out. It's to mm. call out, um, I suppose, foibles, yeah. pretensions. Uh, and you start with yourself always. Yeah. Like I am a very pretentious person mm. uh, a, a lot of the time. And you've got to recognize that and you've got to poke fun at that. Mm. So you've got to poke fun at everything. And, and, and it's why I have kind of reservations about comedians who are too ideological or too right. political. Yeah. Even though I might love them. Mm. Uh, and even though I might share absolutely their political sensibilities. Mm. I just find that, you know, I think the comedian has to take a further step back, has okay. to take a little step back and be a little bit more objective and a little bit more, you know, you know, obviously, you know, if, if you, you know, you've got to poke fun at Trump and Brexit and all mm. the clearly bizarre phenomena mm. that are happening in the world at the moment. But you also have to make fun of liberal, liberal pieties mm. and all that kind of stuff yeah. as well, yeah. you know, and that kind of, po-faced hmm. stuff that has crept into the discourse. You think it, years. yeah, you think it has. Well, of course it yeah, has. Yeah. And, 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 you know, it's not to say that, you know, political correctness, for want of a better term, is not really necessary and hmm. welcome and, you know, really important. And there are people out there who aren't as strong as other people yeah. and they need protection. And, hmm. you know, there are people out there who are, you know, struggling with their identity and yeah, all sorts yeah. of things like that. And, you know, and I, I don't think it's your job as a comedian to poke fun at that. Hmm. But, you know, you've got to call out like lifestyle fads and you've got to call out absurdities, absurdities. And, you know, mm. and that's the starting point. Mm. And that's I'm, never gone away since I was at school. Right. Like that kind of feeling that, you know, life is absurd. And, mm. you know, you, you know, we're all very puffed up with our own importance. Yeah. And, 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 you know, particularly as we get on in life and, you know, become stakeholders in society and, yeah. you know, get honoured. And, and is that the writer in you as well, though, because... You know, one of the things people will say, like, you know, writers will say is that, you know, politics or that idea, there is nothing really in politics that will help us understand, like, how it is to kind of live and who we are as, yeah. as humans. Like, you have to go, as you say, yeah. pull back further than that. No. So is that the writer in you as well, like that observer 
that is making those distinctions. Yeah, I, I, I think it is. And it's also like my sources of nourishment are mm. from writers, yeah. or songwriters or, you know, music yeah. or song or books or mm. even comedians to some extent. But, you know, mainly novelists and people yeah. like that, you know, they're the they're the priests who I right. kind of, you know, at whose altars yeah. who would you, I worship. Like, like who would you worship at? Well, at the moment, it would be someone like Kevin Barry in an yeah, Irish context. Yeah. I, I think he's great. Yeah, he's and, uh, and because he's so hilarious, yeah. probably the funniest writer in any medium in Ireland, you know, mm. people mightn't take him as seriously as they should. Mm. I, I don't know if he's underestimated. I don't really know. I'm not following it that closely. But I read all his books and I, I can't wait for his next utterance, his mm. next sentence. All his sentences are beautiful. Mm. You know, they're all his all his paragraphs are gorgeous. Almost every line is quotable. It's right. and and he has tapped into something about the Irish psyche and the Irish soul. He's got a direct line to it. Yeah, the dark mm. recesses of the mm. Irish soul and Irish psyche. And I and I, I just think it's it's quite profound mm. and quite magical. Like it's lyrical. It's beautiful. Everything he writes. Yeah. Um. So take me back then to that time because you you said there about you know suddenly you're in it. I know you're joking about being in it for fame and and money, but you did become famous, and fame was was thrust upon you. And I'm wondering how that was to deal with. I remember John Giles said to me once. I know you're a Leeds fan as well. Fan. John Giles is another hero. Of yeah, mine. and he said to me once. He said, "Fame is a pain in the fucking arse." <laughs> Is yeah. that how you would have felt about it? Yeah, to some extent, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I, I, I was just uncomfortable with it. Yeah. I think um, when, it, when it happened, I didn't expect it to happen. I didn't ask for it to happen. Mm. It did happen as a, as, a, as, a, as a result of a very successful sitcom that yeah. I was in. Um, and there's not much you can do about it. You just have to kind of navigate it. Yeah. And it's a new experience. And you kind of... You know, in the bravado of relative youth at the time, yeah. you think you can handle it. Uh, but I didn't handle it particularly well. In what way? Well, I just didn't know. I just didn't know about it, really. Like, I, you know, I suppose saying stupid things in interviews okay. would be would be a right. big one. Yeah. Uh, three or four times, like, I was incredibly embarrassed by stuff that appeared in the newspaper. Right. Um, there was a number of occasions. I mean, there was one... There was one, like there was one where, I suppose I, I was in an interview for a Scottish newspaper about a a, a part in a film that I had based on the Scottish folk story uh, Greyfriars Bobby mm. story about a little puppy, um, who stayed at his master's grave for years. He was famous in Edinburgh, right? And there was a lovely film made about it years ago that I was in, and I was given an interview, f- um, promoting that film. Mm. And I was asked about my wife and I said something like, oh, God, yeah, you know, because we've been together since we were like teenagers yeah. and, you know, still get on fantastically well and, and everything. And it's great. But I, I, you know, I would always make jokes about her in interviews. Mm. Always like, uh, you know, I would always make up jobs for her and stuff like that. Okay. And just whatever. Yeah. You know, yeah, when yeah. people say, what does your wife do? Oh, she's a gymnast. Or, you know, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and just to see what it would turn up in the right, interview. Yeah. And I remember saying, oh, God, yeah, oh God, we've been together since we were teenagers. So it's all about tone. Mm. Uh, oh, I tried to leave her so many times, but oh, she's just, <laughs> you know, something like that yeah. was the way I said yeah, it. Yeah. And you think the journalist is in cahoots with you. Yeah, yeah. But I don't know how that appeared in the Scottish newspaper, but about a month later, it appeared in the Evening Herald, repackaged. Yeah. Headline, Ardlo Hanlon tries to leave his wife. <laughs> <laughs> so my wife's down at the butchers in Rat Mines in Dublin and they're going oh Jesus I believe he's trying to leave you and she's going what what's this all about oh did you not see the Herald this morning uh, uh, she's going well, that's the first I heard of it and of course the first I heard of it right. it was a completely different interview yeah. than given months ago so you know just learning how the world right. how, that, how that world worked was mm. a bit of a, a learning curve and there were worse ones as well I mean I remember I did an interview for a women's magazine I can't even remember the name of it now but uh Again, I was asked about drugs or something or mm. do you take drugs or whatever? And I said, oh, God, yeah, I love drugs. I, I put cocaine on my toast every morning mm. or yeah. something yeah, like yeah. that. Again, it was a flippant remark, yeah. stupid mm. remark. Just, you know, yeah, uh, yeah, I love, you know, I love drugs. Like, yeah. A few weeks later, uh, after that magazine came out, um, the I think it was the Irish Sun or the Irish Mirror uh, had a banner headline. Um, Father Ted stars drug shame. Right. And it was the whole headlines, yeah. all the murders and everything relegated to the yeah, second yeah. page. Uh, this was, was your, the headline. Right. And you wake up to this and yeah, you go, yeah. 
how did that happen? Yeah. Yeah. Because uh, I don't see myself in that way as no. in any way a celebrity or, yeah. or, or, you know, a famous person. Mm. You know, you, you just don't. And, you know, you're just trying to get through the day, like same as everyone else, yeah. you know, going, what am I going to do today mm. with my life? And then you wake up and you see this. You've got my father on the phone going, drugs aren't cool. And I'm going, right. yeah, yeah. you know, I, I'm trying to explain that then. Mm. So all the Irish radio shows want you to go on and explain it. And you're kind of going, well, well you know, how do you explain it, that? It to was me? a joke. And of course, you know, yeah. a lot of the Irish radio shows were kind of, you know, con you know, really slamming me because, yeah. of course, they were just seeing the headline. Yeah. And going, you know, who does he think he is pontificating about drugs? Mm. I didn't pontificate yeah. about drugs. I made a stupid flipping remark in yeah. a very lighthearted, mm. jolly interview in a women's magazine months previously. Yeah. So, you know, all that is really hard to deal with. Yeah. And was anything like, did you, like you say, your father calling up, like was his background and life and politics have in, like educated you or helped you in any way when those things happen because you said he presented a certain you know he always presented himself in a certain way in public where you being to think like i see why i see why he did that now absolutely <laughs> i do think you become circumspect uh yeah. as you go on and that's a shame because yeah. you know i'm always interested in very frank interviews i love noel gallagher interviews mm. for example you know you're going to get good mileage you're going yeah, to get yeah. good value he doesn't censor himself and it's always good fun yeah and but I find myself like do I do sense of myself in interviews, I think, mm. of course you do. And, you know, now with social media and with like a, any misstep mm. uh, or, 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 you know, miscommunication yeah. in any way can be seized upon, mm. can be turned against you. You know, people, things will be taken out of context, mm. you know, so you do have to be very careful. What the uh, interest even on stage. Yeah. But I'm interested in that now. I was thinking because I I'd forgotten until I until this week when I started researching this that. You mentioned like when 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 Father Ted came out first, there was a bit of a reaction from Irish people in Britain who felt it was sort of pandering yeah. to a stereotype. Like I was wondering, like today, would it survive? Because you said like when I heard you talk about this previously, you said like, you know, by the time the second series came out, everyone kind of calmed down mm. and realized that it was playing on it and. It was, you know, there wasn't, it wasn't some sort of anti-Irish trope, clearly, obviously. But yeah. today, I wonder, would, you know, the, the, the hysteria, yeah. if there was something like that, it would, it would, it would accelerate very quickly. You would think, mm. you would think it would not get past the commissioner's desk. Right. You would think nowadays people would go, oh no, that's, it's too anti-Irish. We couldn't touch that. Yeah. You know, you would really think that. I mean, the BBC, for example, the most woke organization in history, mm. they're not going to touch anything. Uh, you do find broadcasters bending over backwards to try and be as inoffensive as possible. Mm. But it's it's really inconsistent mm. is the other kind of weird thing. Mm. You know, um, like like some people get away with murder. Like it's, yeah, it's, yeah. it's really weird, isn't it? I mean, just what's going on in, in uh, you know, I love Will Ferrell films. Mm. Step Brothers, all those mm. things, Anchorman, you know, mm. uh, uh, um, and, you know, the other stuff. Judd Apatow stuff, mm. you know, and The Hangover and all those things. Like, you know, shocking and outrageous, but totally free from, you know, ring fence from 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 kind of being called out in right. the way that other things are. Yeah. And why is that? You I know? don't know. Yeah. It's just inconsistent and it's weird. So, so you can't be sure if it's a defining moment in our culture mm. uh, or if it's just, if it's just something that people are blowing up about now and that maybe things that go back to being a little bit more flexible in the future. Yeah. You just don't know. But we are in the middle of a, you know, call it the culture wars, whatever. Mm. And, and you know, definitely you do have to pick pick a side. Yeah. You know, and, you know, I definitely lean towards the more liberal side, you know, of things. Um, I do think it's important to be very, very respectful mm. uh, of, of, for the most part of people, um, you know, and, 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 and respect boundaries and so on. So... You know, you learn and you navigate. Yeah. This is why I still do stand up, though. It's it's exactly why I'm still out there. It's it's, you know, just when you think you've made sense of the world, mm. just when you think, like you know, I'm, I'm sort of, uh, I'm my fifties, mm. uh, I know what's going on, and then you don't. The yeah. world shifts yeah. again, and and a, a big lurch it's yeah. taken recently. You know, there's a lot of dramatic changes mm. going on. Clearly, you know, and and uh, and you do feel you have to, you know, fall down on one side or the other. There's no nuance anymore. There's yeah. no middle ground. Well. I want to ask you about that because, you know, you've lived, you, you, you lived in London for what, 10 years or so, but yeah. yeah. Uh, and you're back and forth all the time. And we talk about sort of anti-Irish 
uh, you know, feeling of with Father Ted. But those forces are are legitimately kind of are not legitimately, but they're genuinely kind of released again at the moment. Yeah. And as somebody who grew up, you know, immersed in in English culture, and this has been something we've talked about with a lot of different guests on this show. You know, and like Leeds United and English comedy and English music and all Just these things. Yeah. Uh, what do you feel about the situation as you see it now? And like you live back in Dublin now, but the relationship between the countries and Brexit and what it's doing to it? Well, I think it's incredibly strong. That's the first mm. thing. Uh, although when you go out of London and some of the metro- metropolitan areas in, in, in Britain, you know, you do experience a kind of a gentle kind of an anti-Irish thing. Not anti-Irish necessarily. Yeah. I mean, you know, but but um, the old tropes are still very yeah. alive and well. You know, the drinking, the stupidity, mm. the fecklessness, all mm. those things, you know, that you even find that amongst our unionist friends in the north sometimes, mm. you know, the way they look look down upon us just yeah. in, 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 in some way down here. Um, so all those things are are, are, are still there. And, right. you know, obviously, you know, the you know, the, because of the convulsions we've mm. had over the last few years, they've come right back up to the surface yeah. again. And the British press, the right wing British press are really, you know, laying into us mm. big time uh, at the moment. And it's a shame. I mean, but, you know, you do have to say that the Brits are genuinely entitled to Brexit. Mm. They're entitled to their fantasy. Absolutely. <laughs> and we cannot deny them that. Yeah. Fantasy. God knows we're fantasists in our own way here. You know, we have our own mythology about mm. what it is to be Irish. We mm. invented Irishness in, in the early part of the 20th century. You know, we 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 made it up in opposition mm. to Britain mm. and England, particularly, I suppose. And this is a this is a particularly English crisis of confidence that's happening at the moment. A big right. identity crisis for the English. They're trying to reinvent themselves now, redefine themselves, and they're absolutely entitled to do it. It's just the way they're handling it that is so problematic. Mm. You know, the complete ignorance of Irish history, mm. uh, their, 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 their abdication of responsibility, you know, as guarantor of the Good Friday yeah. Agreement is a massive thing for us in this country. But and it's very hard for us to convey that to the British public, because why should they know about Irish history, you know? I mean, yeah. Well, they, yeah, I, I guess that like there's a, there's an imbalance there, which in some ways is, is just a natural, because we know everything about them. Yeah. So we get very sensitive yeah. and, and naturally annoyed when they don't know anything about yeah. us but like you come from a border county you know what the peace process has done you know what uh what the damage uh, return of a border well do. i've said it before you know the peace process that day mm. the day of the, the the good friday agreement was signed you know that day w- w- is one of the great days of my life i mean you know not that i was in any way <laughs> intimately involved in the troubles <laughs> i swear uh or not that in any way, you know, um, you know, that I would I would equate my experience of, of what it was like to live across the border in mm. the north during the troubles. Mm. But, you know, growing up on the border, it was a great day. It was up there with Ireland, you know, being at World Cups. And, yeah. you know, it was yeah. it was it was it was it was it was just it was a great, joyful mm. occasion. And, you know, the peace was so hard worn one. Mm. It, it is it is remarkably intact. Mm. I mean, you you know, obviously there's there's the odd. Um, you know, atrocity still, mm. but you know, no other peace process that I can remember is 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 as enduring as that. Mm. Um, you know, if 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 they've worked at all on any level, yeah. this is incredible. After what people went through, and to forget about that or to blithely disregard that mm. is a massive abdication of responsibility on the on the on the part of the of the Tories. And so when you say they have their fantasy and they're entitled to do that, how do they reconcile that with the reality there? Well, I don't know mm. how to do it, but they have to have a, re- have, a have a serious rethink. I mean, you know, uh, I'm mightily impressed by the likes of Simon Coveney mm. uh, in, 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 uh, and Irish politicians of all political hues, actually, the way they have managed to hold the line on this because mm. it is existential for us. It is very, very important. I don't think it's overstated. I try to kind of figure out ways. Could we not just ditch the backstop? I mean, I'm not a politician, mm. you know, I, uh, uh, I, I wouldn't envy a politician now, but I do think it's really, really important. I'm absolutely sold on that. I'm convinced by that. I don't think I don't think there's any issue like cross border trade is one thing, but peace and and, 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 and and making sure we never return to violence is, is a far more fundamental thing. Mm. And I think that is definitely in jeopardy, you know, if there's a hard Brexit. Um, when did you decide to move back here? Because you I like. Ted had obviously, you know, was this huge thing in your life. Did you 
like just before we go back on get onto that like other aspects of, of the fame I'm, I'm interested in i saw you did you, you you sang my lovely horse at slain didn't you at moby yes like that must like when you talk about fame being fame being uh, an irritant that must be one of those instances where it's uh it's actually quite a good thing is it well i don't know i like i i i i, I maybe maybe i'm um what what's the word <laughs> um i look gift horses in the mouth or whatever I remember that day when when I when I got the call from Moby <laughs> to uh, perform with him at Slane yeah. uh, in front of eighty thousand people in a, on a beautiful September day, um, or was it August? Uh, September was the day Ireland played Holland. Exactly, yeah. and so my priority was Ireland Holland mm. that day, and I was at that match. Right, and I remember I remember just saying, "No, sorry, can't make it, Moby." <laughs> Can't can't play to eighty thousand people tonight because Ireland are in a vital World Cup qualifier yeah. against Holland. Um, so they they said, oh well, look, we can we can get you down there in a helicopter after the match, and you'll still be in time for the show. Okay, and I'm going. So I, I was thinking of other excuses, but I want to go for a pint with my friends after. So uh, um, I was glad I went, but I, it, it was it was absolutely absolutely nerve wracking. I, I remember, imagine I was, I was so terrified, like. I, I just never understood that, you know, that whole rock monster thing. Mm. Uh, but when you're in front of that m- amount of people, there, like people talk about the energy coming yeah. off stage and you feed off the energy and everything else. I didn't know that that was a physical thing. Like it, it is like a tsunami hitting right. you in the face. It's physical. Okay. Yeah. And I went momentarily blind and deaf when I was up there. So I don't actually have a clear memory of being on stage. with. What Mo- do you mean by that? You- well, you, as soon as you step out on the stage... Mm. And of course, I, I, you know, me being me, he was thinking, oh, they're going to hate me. They, they're here to see Moby and you two later on and they don't want to see me and I'm going to fucking ruin it for everyone. And they won't know Father Ted, like some of them will, but most of them mm. won't. They're not here. But they, mm. they all knew the words. It, it, it was an incredible. And the roar when you go on stage and that roar is what I'm talking about. Like it was like I was, it was, it, it hit, hit me. You. Like, so it was a massive wave of sound, yeah. which is physical. It's, it's literally, yeah. it's, it's, it's. I don't know physics that well, but I think yeah. there was there was waves mm. uh, that hit me in the face and kind of knocked me out for a, mm. for, for a minute or two. So I don't actually remember. Wow. That's incredible. Yeah. And you've ever seen it? Ever? No. And a friend of mine, Andy Hughes, who's a, who's a filmmaker, mm. was doing a lot of stuff for U2 at the time. So he was doing a lot of their backstage stuff. And um, he, he had it on tape. And in fact, I think Seamus McGarvey was doing it as well, who's a brilliant DOP, who's mm. gone on to do amazing stuff in Hollywood. And they had it, as far as I know, but um, I, I, I never saw it. They never okay. showed it to me because I think you two are just very protective of their right. stuff. So. Okay. So, like, so that's the kind of, when you look back in those years, like, did that, when did that fame pass? Or is it something, has Dougal's been something that's, like, does it stay with you? Like, does it not? <laughs> <laughs> I had a fella come up to me the other night, um, not the other night, but about a year ago, I was doing a gig in St. Albans in, near London and... Uh, he came up to me and uh, he looked very like me, <laughs> like he was my genuine doppelganger. And he came up to me not to kind of have a laugh. He came up to give out to me, saying that his life is a misery because he looks like me. And it turned out he was a policeman in London. That's, oh, no. That was his job and that no one took him seriously. And he was like genuinely upset about this. <laughs> I'm looking at him, it's not my fault. And he's looking at me and he's, he actually told me about the first time he ever made an arrest. <laughs> the criminals start laughing and I'm going, for a fact's sake, I've been arrested by Father Duke. <laughs> and uh, so and I'm going, well, look, I look more like myself. Can you imagine what it's like for me? <laughs> you know, you think you have a bad. <laughs> uh, so you just compared notes of kind of misery. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's an extraordinary one. Yeah. No, it definitely is more manageable as you get older. But you know how to navigate it. You know, you know, yeah. how to, you know, sidestep mm. it. Uh, but people generally, in my experience, have always been friendly. They've always been nice. If mm. someone wants a photograph, it's not a big deal. If someone wants an autograph, mm. so, or just a chat. Um, <laughs> or just some pair notes. a real about priest. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but, you know, you know, yeah, yeah. I, I, one, 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 you know, one way of dealing with it is not to pander to celebrity culture. Okay. Um, and I think I've always managed to steer clear of social media, for example. Um, not get involved in all of that. Steer clear of reality shows. Yeah. Which you know, is a temptation for some. Never for me, mm. I have to say. Um, even steer clear of panel shows and things like that, which you know I quite like. And mm. you know, obviously, some some of my friends and contemporaries have made great careers out of yeah. appearing on panel shows. But it's just. 
I don't know. I just, the whole thing, uh, you know, do your job, do it as well as you can and then go home. And was coming home a help in that regard because you weren't like, you know, you weren't available. If somebody called, you know, needed a, a, someone on a panel at nine o'clock on a Thursday, if you were in London, you might be there. Whereas, yeah, was it a help yeah, that you, you took them to? Yeah. yeah, I think it was actually. Yeah. Are you going to go over like just for a, a, a one off appearance of yeah. a thing? You know, maybe you're not like, you're not, you know, no, I got a babysit. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it's, it was more a personality thing. Mm. It was like, I just wasn't that pushy, you know, about those okay. kind of things. I, you know, on those panel shows, they're very competitive, you know. Right. Um, they're brilliant. So it suits a more, I guess, brasher type of comedian than me, mm. I think. Um, I, I, I was asked to, like, to present, you know, some okay. well-known yeah panel shows right. um, you know in their infancy yeah. and I, I kind of really regret <laughs> not doing that now uh, you know one particular one that has gone on for years and years and years and it's really good um, so yeah I know I've made some terrible calculations in my career okay you were cold feet was one of those things, <laughs> I remember going in for the audition for cold feet and kind of going no nah, it's rubbish <laughs> Do you, so, you told them that did you <laughs> cocky <laughs> that, yeah. so it'll never never take off <laughs> Are you like, this is like, you know, when they put together, like the players Arsene Wenger could have signed. Is yeah. there a similar chart for you and like shows you could have done? Well, there are. Yeah. Well, not, well, maybe. I mean, you know, there never are offers. They're, you know, they're, yeah, they're yeah. kind of, you know, you're, 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 we're considering yeah, you very yeah. seriously for this mm. role. And, and would you be interested? So mm. I'm not saying, you know, it was a, a, yeah, an yeah. offer. Yeah. I mean, there's been lots of offers for reality shows and things mm. like that. But, you know, they're easier to just mm. say, no, it's not my area. It's not my cup of tea. And was the process of that, did that ever get any easier? The idea of putting yourself as you said like not just with the panel shows where you have to have a certain type of personality but just going into auditions putting yourself forward for things did that did you ever find that easier no 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 <laughs> I, I've been really lucky in my career though I, I would say that in the sense that most of the jobs that I've got you know the bigger jobs mm. like the, the leading roles and stuff they have generally come directly to me you know where I haven't yeah. had, had to go through the humiliation of, a, of an audition mm. process so in that sense, I'm very lucky. But in another sense, you know, I feel I'm not considered for loads of stuff. Do you know what I mean? Okay. I'd love to go into auditions for things, you know, where people would give me a shot at something a bit different maybe mm. than what I'm, you know, used to doing. Um, so, you know, it is a weird career. I mean, the career for everyone, I think every actor, comedian mm. type person is is going to be a little bit odd and it's uh, and there's no one way of going about it. Yeah. Uh, and you do, you will be forced to make critical decisions at critical junctures in your career. Mm. Of course you will. Um, so, you know, you can't moan about it too much. Like, I mean, uh, you know, most actors would, 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 would you know, are, don't work at all. Yeah. Like that's the reality for most, most actors at any one time. You're not working. Mm. Um, sometimes you've got to do other jobs that you don't really want to do to make ends mm. meet. So, you know, I've always been very lucky to hang in there, <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. try and keep myself interested and, and, and do different things. You know, I think that's really important as well is that you don't get... You know, you don't begin to hate your job. You right. know, you you, yeah. you 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 find other ways to tell stories. Mm. You know, you know, I got involved in documentaries. You know, you know, I, I I've written. Uh, yeah. You know, and you, you, you made that great documentary about the uh, death in Ireland. Oh yeah. Yeah, that was must have been enjoyable to do. Right? It was brilliant. Yeah. yeah, I'm really interested in you know uniquely Irish stuff. So yeah. Hiberniana, for want of a better word. Right. You know, but like Americana, mm. or, uh, but Hiberniana. You know, and and. Uh, uh, I think Irish funeral culture and our obsession with death notices kind yeah. of um, fits in with that. Yeah. You know, it's it's unique, it's special, it's it's meaningful, it's, you know. And, mm. and, um, and do you have an obsession with death beyond that, beyond the, the Irish, you know, the Hibernia kind of first, you Beyond know, the normal uh, Irish person's obsession yeah, the, with death. Well, it's just that obs you know, obsession with the, the, uh, the you know, the, you know the, 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 the act of it itself. Like, is that something that worry, like terrifies yeah, you? It plagues or, me, yeah. Does it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it keeps, keeps me going keeps me every day. Um, uh, yeah, I, I do think like a lot of, you know, staying active and everything is trying to, you know, is trying to fill your time as best mm. you can, uh, you know, until the moment. Yeah. Uh, trying to, you know, yeah, absolutely. Uh, trying to, I don't know, I, I think anything you immerse yourself in, anything that mm. you get consumed with, whether it's a, an interesting hobby or whether it's an interesting job or, or any sort of a obsessional behavior is 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 about staving off death. I, mm. I believe that. Do you? Yeah, I do, actually. You think it hangs over people that, that yeah, profoundly? I do. I do. I do. Yeah. yeah. You know, you see someone like Dennis O'Brien or someone like that, you mm. know, he's obviously 
He's just, you know, terrified of dying. Terrified of dying. <laughs> it's probably the only thing we can say about him without getting sued. <laughs> yeah. No, and we flirt with it as well, don't we? You know, by taking risks and all that. What is that only kind of flirting with? Yeah. With your own mortality, you know, even standing on stage to some in a minor way. It's like, mm. it's like, you know, you're taking a leap into the unknown, you know, skiing down a. Right. You know, all those things like. Yeah, which was also the, ad- yeah, and the adrenaline then of that yeah. is, is a great yeah. sort of antidote to. Yeah. So I wouldn't say I'm a morbid person, but I'd say like, you know, I do, I do, I do have this fear of, of, of what lies beyond. Yeah. And what do you think lies beyond? Well, I kind of hope nothing. Yeah. Like it's just nothing. And then that yeah, and your consciousness doesn't exist anymore. So you're not aware that you're now part of nothing. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, which doesn't make any sense. No, but yeah, I know what you mean. <laughs> Just it's a full stop. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. Rather than thinking, oh, yeah. So I'm not like I'm not one of those people who is, you know, spiritual in that mm. sense. And do you think did that ever do you ever tempted by any of that? No, 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 no. I don't think I've ever found any sort of orthodoxy of any sort, like whether it's political, mm. political ideology, whether it's religion. Or anything, you know. I don't think I found that. I'm not. I haven't been looking for it, to be honest yeah. with you. Um, was you your know, upbringing religious? Yes, yes, quite, quite religious. Like yes. not more than just mass and. Uh, so no, more. there would be rosary as well. Okay. Yeah. yeah. At times, not always, but there would have been years where the rosary would have been a thing, or mm. months at least. You know, yeah. um, not like loony moving statue type mm. stuff, but you know, yeah, definitely, you know, religion would have been a big part of. The and, year and, yeah, the and then school was religious yeah. as well. And I'm a big fan of religion in one way, you know, even though I'm not a religious person. I'm a fan of religion in in the sense that it marks time, you know, and and and, and I think, you know, in, in our country, the Catholic Church you, you know, mostly, um, you know, does the whole marking of the important mm. events in your life really, really well. Mm. Most priests I've met are fantastic people. They're incredibly articulate people, incredibly thoughtful, mm. you know, helpful people. And they make great speeches. Uh, you know, mass is a good thing. It's a social ritual. It's really important. It's a binding ritual. You know, these things are really important. Uh, religious schools are fantastic communities. You know, mm. um, Jesus is brilliant, is a brilliant role yeah. model. You know, you don't have to believe in God to believe in Jesus. This mm. is what I always say. You know, it's like, you know, Jesus is a good role model. Yeah, uh, what's yeah. not to like about yeah. his message? Mm. Um, what's not to like about trying to emulate the life of Christ mm. as best as you can? You know, treat people with respect, turn mm. the other cheek, all those fantastic yeah, ideas. Some quite revolutionary ideas in yeah. there as well. You know, that's what I think, you know, when you hear someone like Israel Falau, you know, the, mm. the, the yeah. brilliant rugby player from Australia, mm. you know, when he's, when, he's, when he's tweeting these homophobic remarks, mm. why don't you tweet the really nice stuff? <laughs> yeah. Like... Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, to, to tell us about not, you know, turning the other cheek, being tolerant. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. You know, all, yeah, those, yeah. all those things. Yeah. And you 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 came back to Dublin, ten, when did you come back? 2006, was it? Uh, 2006, kind of firmly, yeah. Right. Yeah. And your kids grew up, all grew up here then, really? Yes. Were they yes. born in London? Uh, no, we came back for all the births. Okay. As well, yeah. And uh, what ages are they now? Um... What is that now? 22, 20 and 17. Okay. So they're, are they leaving home? Are they? No. <laughs> no. No, I'm glad. I mean, you know, yeah. it's fantastic having them around. I mean, they're all. No, but they're entering that stage. Two of them are in university yeah. in Dublin and uh, one of them is at school mm. still. Uh, so, no, I mean, you know, like, it, like, like, like most people of their generation, they couldn't afford to move out. Yeah. Um, so, you know, they're, 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 they're quite happy. Yeah. I think at home. But is it something now you're entering that's, you know, because again, reading about you this week and you say like you'd be happiest, you know, doing some work and playing tennis with your kids. And uh, I imagine as they enter this stage where they're entering the, the kind of adulthood yeah. stage of your life. And for somebody as reflective as you are, it must be a kind of a bittersweet. Like my son, who's only five, is starting school next week. And my wife is kind of wondering if I can even go. Yeah. Because I think, you know, you're like, I was going to fall apart. I like, know. You know, it's bringing a tear to my eye <laughs> as you speak about it. Yeah. So I wonder yeah. how you feel as they enter this stage. Yeah, I mean, I'm just like, I mean, I'm so proud of them. And, I'm you know, I'm, I'm so happy to see that they're well-adjusted people. That's mm. the main thing, you mm. know, and they're just doing well. And, you know, they're healthy and, you know, they're 
they're so go ahead and you know it's it's amazing like mm. when i was that age i didn't have a clue what i wanted to do and mm. I, you know i i am um, you know i and i was shy and i was awkward and I, you know and i and i see these fantastic young people you know just making their way in the world it's it's it's, it's brilliant and I think there is a sense that myself and my wife, we are kind of bracing ourselves for the mm. time when they actually leave and yeah. we're trying to figure out what we do. <laughs> what we do. Yeah. But we're going through that weird stage now, you know, the alcohol thing and everything. Right. And, you know, yeah. and it's just that thing of like the hypocrisy, you know, lecturing your kids about the perils right. of alcohol yeah, while yeah. actively uncorking the second bottle of wine. <laughs> 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 so, you know, you, you know and, and I don't have a leg to stand on, you know, because yeah. I didn't do particularly well at school. You mm. know, I didn't really apply myself. Um, and... Uh, you know, I, I didn't really, you know, I didn't have a sensible job. So, you know, mm -hmm. I find, you know, it is hard to, you know, like to, to, I don't know, to instill, you know, whatever, you know, whenever mm -hmm. you try to instill in them. But, you know, they're doing well and that's all you can ask for. Ardell, best of luck with the tour. And it's been a real privilege to have you here today. Oh, thanks Thank for being on. Cheers. Thanks. Thank you. Really love that with Ardell O'Hanlon today. Uh, Ardell is on tour again in October and November on the Showing Off Must Go On tour. As we mentioned at the top of the show, he'll be playing in Cork at the Opera House on the 30th of October. He's in Dublin in Vicar Street on the 9th of November in the University Concert Hall in Limerick on the 29th of November. He's also going to be at the Vodafone Comedy Car Carnival in Galway on, with the, on the 26th of October and he's really worth checking out. Um, and we'll see you next time and don't forget to subscribe to Ireland Unfiltered on all the usual channels. Mm -hmm.